Okay, I think we're all set now. I apologize for the small interruption. Um, so I guess that, you know, the one thing, you know, I've developed this presentation over the years and of course, you know, the pandemic kind of created, um, like I said, a bigger spotlight on kids' mental health issues and, and, and how to help them with their mental health issues. This slide actually I made before the pandemic. So um, just as a way of kind of, you know, framing the conversation, prior to COVID, we were already seeing, um, you know, a, a crisis point in, in children's mental health issues and, and the need for more services and the more supports for them. Um, you know, anxiety kind of being at the top of the list. Um, but, you know, uh, obviously over the course of the last couple of years, you know, we've gotten, you know, I guess we can say the upside of the pandemic has been a little bit more um, kind of public notice of that and some good media attention of that. Um, and hopefully we'll start to see the pendulum swing. Um, but that that pendulum needed to start sw sw swinging way before um, the school shut down on March 17th, 2020. At least that was the, the date up in the Syracuse area. Um, as you can see, Things were shifting way before 2020. Um, so if you, you take a look, um, you know, it, generally speaking, all three of those lines, which represent um, numbers in depression, anxiety, and relationship issues, were, um, you know, we're, we're starting to they're trend in the wrong direction. Okay. Um, and as you can see, the red line representing anxiety took a, the biggest turn. Um, so relationships green were, were struggling, they're going down. We were seeing um, slightly more numbers in depression overall, anxiety um, being at the top of the list and, and, and struggling. Anyone wanna guess, if you can tell on the graph, 2009 seemed to be a pivotal point. Anyone wanna guess what else happened in 2009? Well, not to drag out the excitement, but that was also when the smartphone was invented. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, you know, um, you know, the impact of social media, but um, I don't think that it's a coincidence that those dates coincide. I think that we've seen, um, you know, some some significant negative consequences of of the the, the properly, you know, the, the increase in all of the um, the um, the social media that that um, kids have access to now, and um, and we'll talk a little bit about why it's important to not ban that, but to, to limit that and to be smart about um, helping our children manage their time on social media. Okay. So again, why are we seeing a, an increase? I mean, you know, in addition to what I hinted at just earlier regarding social media, um, there are other reasons why we're seeing an increase in not just anxiety, but in other um, mental health issues um, as well, you know, dealing with a lot of these kind of big, uncomfortable feelings that kids experience. Um, I don't, you know, schools, I, I can tell you since I was in high school, which I know is a really long time ago, but bear with me, um, you know, since I was in high school, there's been a definite shift in the importance of grades and what I call outcomes to school, you know, a lot more focus on um, report cards and SAT scores, which are, are, you know, now kind of trending again in the in the opposite direction as far as importance, but where I'm going to school, how many schools I apply to, and, you know, just college, college, college as it is, you know, so there's definitely been a shift education-wise in, you know, in kind of what we focus on and what kids are, 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 are focused on. I think that's created a little bit um, of accumulated worry for them. Um, we're certainly seeing trends to, you know, of earlier and earlier puberty, um, you know, there's obviously that's way outside my expertise area as to, you know, kind of why that is happening, but that, I think that is also contributing to issues dealing with bigger emotions um, over time. Um, you know, I mean, we, we in general are not necessarily in a more volatile time when it comes to violence, but we're certainly seeing evidence of it quickly, you know, thanks to television, thanks to phones, thanks to social media and instant cameras, um, you know, we have access to, you know, information about violence much quicker than, than a long time ago. So, you know, not only are we seeing an uptick in, in violence, you know, in, in areas that kids are susceptible to, like schools, like their communities, but we're, we have so much more video evidence of it now. Um, 
you know, that, that we have such access to a camera right in our hands. So, you know, it's just, it's just so much easier um, to, to get this information. Um, you know, there was something really interesting, and I'm not going to get this quote correct, but like, you know, you can have, you have more access to, you have access to more information in one day now than your average kid did in a lifetime a hundred years ago, you know, so, um, you know, in one, one day, the amount of information kids can have access to is definitely contributing to, to heightened levels um, of, of, of feeling. Um, our brains have not changed much since the cavemen. And I don't mean this to be an anthropology lesson, but our brains have it or you know evolve very slowly technology and 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 our, and society have developed much much faster so our brains are being asked to take on more and more information pace stuff everything around them um you know and and not necessarily keeping up with the pace that technology and advancement is is, is making so you know we're we're asking our caveman brains to deal with like 21st century issues and i think that's kind of creating an overload in certain emotional centers of the brain. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the brain later too. You know, you're not gonna get a full you know, neuroscience lesson. Don't worry, I'm gonna keep it to a level that I understand. Um, but I think it's really interesting to know that there are kind of brain related reasons why um, you know, kids are a little more stressed now too. So I have to talk about us parents because we're, you know, wouldn't be a presentation if we didn't blame mom and dad, right? You know, I have my own 20 year old who seems to, despite me, have made it <laughs> to the end of college and I'm very proud of him. Um, but the pendulum of parenting swings as well. And I'm sure you guys have heard the concept of, of the helicopter parent. Um, you know, that was, I know, kind of um, an analogy that that made a lot of sense to me, especially as I became a parent and saw my own anxiety about you know being a mom. Um, I, I think in in some ways we've taken it even a little bit further. And I understand with the pandemic, we all just kind of put our you know mama bear hands on or daddy bear hands on. Um, but you know somebody um, somebody gave me the analogy of a of a snowplow parent now, which is kind of taking it one step you know further of just plowing the way for our children. And we'll talk a little bit about why our parenting, you know, um, style, you know, isn't necessarily obviously something we're going to blame because I mean, there's so many factors as to why our kids are struggling, but our parenting style can certainly be a part of, of helping our kids cope better with daily challenges and cope better with those bigger feelings. So this is actually a good thing. You know, this why obviously is, is leading to bigger numbers, but I think kids today are much more willing to talk about their feelings. And I think that's great. I think kids are much more willing to talk about their identity and who they are, um, which is which is obviously really exciting. And I think kids feel much more comfortable um, sharing, you know, uh, what's going on with them. I think we've done a really good job of decreasing the stigma for mental health support. I think we have a long way to go. I think there's still um, a, a room for education to help families feel more comfortable going to see somebody like me or someone in the school to help with those things. But I think kids in this generation are, are teaching us a nice valuable lesson of, of why it's important to just say, hey, I'm, I'm not feeling good about that. I need some help and I need some support. And then I think the next, you know, point to really overemphasize, as I hinted before, is this constant access to digital devices um, is is really definitely something we need to take a look at. Um, you know, as as mental health experts, as teachers, as parents, um, as service providers, as as folks really, you know, related, you know, um, to connected to, you know, organizations like the Special Education Task Force. Um, it definitely, you know, it might sound cliche at this point, um, but I definitely think that we have enough research now to suggest that we really have to talk about um, limits and 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 what those excessive amounts of time on on social media devices and technology devices means for our kids' mental health. So, do you guys here have any questions? I, I don't want to make this really difficult, but I do. If there's pressing things, and I'll tell you if I'm going to cover it later. So, yeah, we do have a question. I'll try and repeat it so the folks virtually can can hear it too. You talk about devices. Do you 
keep more mean social media or what about non-social things like video games and mm -hmm. how all tv shows are now on demand and you mm -hmm. have to wait for anything is it all of it or is it more so it's all of it but for different reasons so i think i'll touch on your question in a, in a few ways um you know i think that there are better forms of technology than others. Um, and then there are also aspects to technology that make it um, a, a negative factor for kids' mental health. I think the on-demand nature of all aspects of our life right now are an issue. And I think that's, that kind of supersedes all you know, you know, technology as well is that we want everything kind of quickly. And when it doesn't come quickly, we get, we get frustrated and we experience some of those big feelings. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more too about um, um, why, you know, why some aspects of, of social media and technology might be okay versus not okay. And, and what that, you know, what that spectrum looks like. So, uh, you know, just, I don't want to like belabor this is, you know, necessarily want to make this a, a presentation about social media, um, but, you know, I, it is important. So I think we do need to, to kind of talk about it and, and mention it, you know, so what are the aspects of social media specifically in, in respect to technology and devices um, that seems to be exacerbating these big feelings or anxiety? Um, you know, the, to, to answer the on-demand question, you know, um, feedback comes very quickly. Um, you know, with social media. And unfortunately, the feedback that a lot of kids hone in on and focus on is the negative feedback, um, you know, so which which can rise to the level of cyberbullying as well. It doesn't always, but there's constant, you know, um, there's constant feedback and a lot of it negative from 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 peers on social media. Um, obviously, you're becoming more and more aware of other people's stressful events. Um, that, that feedback is coming quicker as well. Um, I think, well, and let me jump to the last point, you know, just all of that pressure to maintain a social network presence, um, you know, always being ready for that perfect selfie, um, always being ready to kind of, you know, you know, um, have that, that perfect post about where you are and what you're doing and forgetting that, you know, a lot of people don't post the negative aspects of social media. They only post the positive and, you know, you get that compare and contrast phenomenon that happens, um, you know, with kids in social media. The, one of the big things for me, and we'll talk a little bit more about this um, during the presentation, is that it tends to be a big detriment to sleep, which in turn has an impact on lots of other things and and um, and indirectly mental health issues. Um, but you know, I'm I'm a firm believer in that. You know, um, we should not have our devices in social media in our bedrooms. I think you know beds are for sleeping. You know, when it comes to kids, um, and that you know um, one of the big issues with with devices is that it's definitely um, getting in the way of, of a good night's sleep. So one of the um, one of the more negative aspects of technology is that it, it tends not to be interactive. You know, it tends to be kind of like that passive, um, you know, that passive browsing. In fact, I was just on vacation with girls, my friends, like my age, and and you know, I was amazed to see you know how quickly everyone was just like scrolling through TikTok, and just getting kind of sucked in. And it's that passive interaction with with social media that tends to have a bigger problem you know um more interactive aspects of of technology and social media can actually be beneficial like more educational programming where there's an actual back and forth and there's learning and there's there's interaction um so it's this kind of passive um use of of social media So yeah, I mean, so that passive just scrolling just makes them more susceptible to that negative feedback. It makes them more susceptible to seeing stressful events and, you know, just makes them more susceptible to that compare and contrast, you know, um, and then I think that's what's really problematic. And that's why I think it's really important that, you know, um, we as parents, you know, remain vigilant and, and aware and knowledgeable about these social media platforms. Um, you know, for, for a while, I spent a good chunk of my free time just learning Snapchat and Instagram and, you know, just setting up my own accounts with my dogs. 
um, you know, just to kind of learn and understand, because I think, um, you know, as I've said to people before, in 1978, when I was seven years old, supervision for my mom meant walking around the neighborhood and looking for my bicycle and saying, oh, she's at so-and-so's house because my bike was in the front lawn or in the driveway. Um, supervision in the 21st century means a lot more. You know, your kid can be sitting right there and you have no idea where they are. You have no idea what they're doing because that internet is so much bigger than my little neighborhood on Long Island, <laughs> you know, and it was much easier to kind of figure out where I was and what I was doing. Um, the internet really does kind of make supervision a, a very difficult, you know, very difficult task for parents. So as I alluded to earlier, there's this, this phrase of, of, um, of snowplow or you know, lawnmower parenting, you know, where you're kind of like the lawnmower or the snowplow creating this beautiful path and your children are just kind of frolicking behind you and benefiting from all the hard work that you're putting in removing all those obstacles, right? Um, but we have to remember that our job is not to create this beautiful path for them because at a certain point, our lawnmower stops working and our snowplow dies. <laughs> and we are no longer there to create that path for them. Our job as parents is to make sure that we give them the tools to create their own path. Um, and I think that's one of the big things that we can do as parents and what I can kind of support parents in doing and, and, and cheering you guys to do is to kind of help them with the tools that they need to make their own path. And making their own path means they have to learn how to manage their feelings and learn how to manage the challenges that that kind of increase those negative feelings. And I think, um, you know, I, I think you as parents are in a, in a beautiful position to, you know, to kind of help kids build those tools, because unfortunately, Mental health services are are, are dwindling. Um, I, I hope that it's going to get better. Um, you know, but we need more. And and um, in, in the meanwhile. Let me guys, let me at least give you an hour's worth of information that can kind of help you understand what you might be able to do a little bit differently tomorrow to help your kids create their own path and, and manage those, those, those tough feelings. So one of the things, you know, I always love this, this quote that an ounce of prevention is worth a, a, a pound of cure, you know, so waiting to react is not nearly as as effective as, as kind of being more proactive. And so I wanna spend a little time talking about those proactive things that you guys can do as, as parents, as families to, um, to kind of help um, maybe minimize the impact of negative feelings and anxiety and, and um, you know, kind of give them the tools ahead of time and get them um, kind of in a balanced, healthy, um, you know, lifestyle choices to kind of help them. Most importantly is to understand your own family history. Um, you know, family history is important. Um, a lot of these um, mental health issues, anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, you know, ADHD, um, you know, more oppositional defiant type um, behaviors tend to run in families. You know, even if there isn't um, a history of, of a lot of diagnoses in your family, there certainly were temperaments. You know, there's those Uncle Joey's and <laughs> that crazy Aunt Betty, um, you know, whereas we benefit now from language and common um, common language in, in diagnoses that kind of help us understand kids. And that wasn't the case, you know, in, in my generation and, and earlier. Um, so, you know, know your own family's history and, and understand, you know, where the genetic vulnerability might be, what your kids may or may not be just, you know, predisposed to. Now, that doesn't mean there's a guarantee that because you know, grandparent A had anxiety that grandchild C is going to have anxiety. Um, because luckily, the environment has a big part, you know, it plays a big, big part in, in who your child becomes. And so I want to talk a little bit about what that environment should look like if we're going to help minimize some of these, you know, these anxiety and big feeling issues. I already touched on this. And this is, um, this has gone from my big four to my big five. Um, so I, I, I've kind of, over the course of the pandemic, you know, kind of had to rethink my big four and I've added it a big five. So I didn't add it to this slide and I apologize for that. I kind of missed that little typo. Um, but we'll start with the four here. The first one is sleep. Our children do not sleep enough. I don't sleep enough. <laughs> we don't sleep enough. Um, the big culprit is the invention of artificial light. Um, that's really been a, you know, a big, you know, a, a big issue. But what happened in 2009? 
we invented even more artificial light in our computers and our smartphones and we started bringing them to bed with us um, and um, we've really um, you know done our sleep patterns a disservice um, there's something our body produces naturally it's called melatonin and it is that chemical that's released um, that kind of helps shut down our system to help us go to sleep. Um, melatonin is triggered by darkness, by the circadian kind of light rhythms that the days naturally have. Now, if we have all the lights on and if we bring our laptop to bed and if we have the TV running, um, we are not allowing our body to produce that natural amount of melatonin needed to get to sleep. Um, so that is why I said from a parenting perspective, um, I don't like televisions in the bedroom at all, and I certainly don't think that we, you know, we they should be on, you know, um, as they go to sleep. Now, there's the exception. There's kids who fall asleep fine with the television, and I get that. I'm going to talk more in kind of general rules tonight. Um, and so when it comes to devices, phones, laptops, um, tablets, and such, I always say at least an hour before you want them to to be falling asleep, we need to shut down those devices, um, which is why I, I think that generally family policy about having having those things charged downstairs in the kitchen or dining room is a good rule, um, um, and that just keeps keeps those things out of you know out of out of the bedroom. Um, now, related to sleep, those next or you know next couple of items, um, their diet uh, is is really important. Um, I think. Um, Having a good balanced nutritional diet is 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 really important and, and striving as a family to eat better and reduce sugar is definitely something that's going to kind of help with those mental health issues. Um, not only does sugar just overall affect mood and irritability, but sugar in, also kind of can interfere and, and other poor food choices um, can interfere with sleep and it interferes with other things that are known to be healthy contributors to positive mental health. We got to get our kids moving a little bit more. You know, that doesn't mean we, we have to have, you know, a marathon runner in every family. It just means that, um, you know, I, I, I think uh, we understand from research that, you know, a good amount of movement throughout the day definitely kind of helps overall with mental health and mood. Um, you know, for a couple of reasons, I do think it helps contribute to better sleep, you know, so you see a lot of interconnectedness with with these factors. Um, I think exercise also, you know, tends to get kids outside um, and being outside in fresh air and vitamin D is also scientifically shown to improve mood and improve, um, you know, overall emotion management. Um, and then again, related to all of those um, is, is this issue of screen time. Um, I like to think of, I'm trying to see if I have this, I don't know. So when it comes to screen time, obviously it's an important part of our kids' lives. I think banning computer use, phone use, tablet use um, is a little short-sighted. This is their future. They need to learn how to use this stuff. Um, it is up to us to teach them how to use it responsibly. Um, so I think we do need to get more comfortable as parents in monitoring that. I don't, um, I, I think um, kids, if they're going to be on YouTube or if they're going to be, you know, on their devices, they need to be at a place where, where, you know, where you can monitor that. Now, as they get into their teenage years, they're going to want a little bit more privacy. And I understand that. Um, but that means, you know, you need to have their passwords and you need to be able to see what they're doing. I think it's important that we take every opportunity that we can to use those teachable moments, um, you know, to help them learn to use their, their, um, their social media responsibly. And I think by viewing it with them, checking in on it, seeing what they're doing, what apps they're using, I think allows us as parents to be able to make sure that they're learning how to use their technology in, in a responsible way. Um, I think managing screen time also um, it, it allows them to explore other types of play. Um, so you know how they talk about the, the food diet and how like the bulk of your, your food intake should be fruits and vegetables and protein and then like the smallest part of, you know, of, of the diet plate is like processed foods and sugar. Well, I want us to think about play in, in the same way. A lot of folks will raise their hand and ask, well, how many minutes a day is okay? And I'll say, well, let's not think about it in minutes. Let's think about it in, 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 in the realm of like their total play diet. 
Um, so if you have a kid who loves to be outside, who you know thrives in just being in the woods and picking up sticks and pretending you know to fight crime and you know all that kind of stuff, well, then I'm not so I'm not so worried about the overall minutes of how much time they're exactly spending on you know like playing video games. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's looking at the total week. It's looking at the total day. And if you, if you have a kid who's really, you know, okay about going outside, loves arts and crafts, you know, and allowing them that time to be on a video game is, is fine. Now, if you have a kid who's, a, it's a real struggle to get them outside, it's a real struggle to get them to engage in other things. Well, then we really do have to look more at total minute limits um, because we want to create that time and space for them to, to want to be outside doing other things. Um, so that, you know, that's kind of looking more at, at the individual kid and the total of what they're doing during the day. And again, there are better forms of, of technology. There are better forms of social media, things that are educational in nature, things that you can do together as a family, like watching a movie, watching a television show. Um, are, are much, much better than a violent video game, which I would say should be limited. Um, that's kind of the, the, the type of video game, the violent ones that, are, that tend to have the, the biggest impact on, on children's mental health. The other thing that I like to talk about are these kind of four pillars of excess. And, and that has a little bit to do with the question that was posed earlier too. Um, you know, one of the one of the four pillars being too much, you know, too much information, too fast a pace. You know, the the internet, you know, era has has really gotten us quite used to instant gratification. Um, you know, like if Amazon doesn't deliver in three days, like I'm angry, and I'm thinking to myself, like, where does that come from? Like, you know, when you know how when did that happen that I've I've become so demanding and in, in getting things quicker? But that's just kind of the nature of the world that we live in right now. But know that that pace, that that influx of information, giving your kids too many choices and having too much stuff for them to choose from um, can really contribute to some of those growing trends in, 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 in mental health issues. So take a look at their toy room. Can you take out two thirds of it and even know that things are missing? Put them in bins, stick them in the attic, rotate those, you know, rotate those bins in and out. It's like Christmas every three months um, because they're getting those new toys back. And, you know, and I do think that we have to, you know, really take a look at the amount of stuff that we have, the amount of choices that we give. I remember a family, um, like this, this young girl, about 12 years old, was involved in like four or five activities a week. And it was really starting to take its toll on, you know, on her overall irritability, on her sleep and all of, you know, those aspects of mental health that we've discussed already. And, you know, the mom was terrified to try and take something away. And, I, I you know, and at, at some point we give our kids way too many choices and way too much, way too much to do. And I think we need to, in some ways, try and incorporate a little bit of that quiet time and, and downtime back into their lives because learning how to manage downtime and, and quiet time is, is actually a big part of good mental health. So those are some of the like kind of more proactive things you wanna keep in mind. Oh, and I forgot to add my fifth pillar, my fifth factor. So there was sleep, diet, exercise, and screen time. But the one other thing too that I've, I, you know, I want us to always keep in mind as parents is, is friend time. Um, and that was a real big, that was huge. That was taken away from them during the pandemic. And I, that was a real big awakening for me, you know, um, not that I didn't think friendships were important, but it really did kind of highlight how important face-to-face -face friend time is. Um, I had one teenager like six months into the pandemic say that I'll, I'll throw my phone in the river if I could just see my friend face-to-face. -face. And I was like, whoa, we are, we are learning something here. Um, you know, and, and kids really do need to be with each other and kids, you know, even if you have an introvert who does better with one friend at a time, that's fine. They don't have to have friends, you know, that span the entire community. Um, but face-to-face -face time with peers is really important. And I would add that to the diet, sleep, exercise, and screen time considerations that families need to make as far as being proactive about, um, you know, helping with their children's mental health. But you've done all that. You've made, you know, you've worked on their sleep. You're, you're working on their diet. You're moving more as a family. You're monitoring your screen time and doing other things. Um, but you know, we we give birth to anxious children. I gave birth to an anxious child. I, I knew he was coming. I was one myself. 
Um, so, you know, what are some things we can do kind of now that we have a kid that might be struggling a little bit with big feelings with anxiety? Well, telling them to stop worrying and stop being sad doesn't work. Have you guys seen the movie Inside Out? I couldn't have written a better feel movie about feelings myself. So if you haven't seen it as a family, I think you should definitely watch it. It's, it's great. Um, but basically, in this movie, each feeling inside this little girl's head is been personified so each feeling has a character so there's a joy there's a depression there's an anger there's a you know and a couple of others um and joy you know kind of runs the show because joy wants to be present all the time joy wants to be in charge she thinks that this girl is only going to be successful in life and she can be happy all the time so she spends like 90 percent of the movie trying to keep depression out of the game she's like gives her these encyclopedias to read she gives her all these stupid tasks just to get depression out because she doesn't think her her person, Riley, should ever be sad. Um, but the moral of the story is that we really have to kind of acknowledge all of our feelings. It's, it's really quite important. Um, and the more Joy tried to keep depression um, you know, out of the picture, the more mayhem created. Because who takes over when depression is kind of thwarted and squashed? Anger. Um, and, and anger in the movie created quite a chaotic scene. So, you know, again, the, the, the long and the short of the movie is that all of our feelings are really important and we have to acknowledge them. But I can't tell you how many times even I've been like, you know, tried so hard to squash my son's uncomfortable feelings. Like, why are you feeling that way? Just be happy. Just be happy. Just be happy. And I failed to take a valuable opportunity to acknowledge the fact that sometimes we as humans get sad. And sometimes we're anxious about things and sometimes we're nervous about things. Um, and we have to kind of maybe make sure that we are taking those times to validate that feelings are okay. And we also want to try and give them the tools to move on from those feelings, you know, and to, and to, and to you know, acknowledge those feelings, but not let them kind of take over either. So what we need to do is to try and help kids get to the, that conclusion themselves. Telling them to stop worrying doesn't work. Generally speaking, trying to talk your kids out of any feeling is a dead end street because all you're doing is letting them know that their feelings don't matter. And so acknowledging those feelings is really important. So you've done all those proactive things, but guess what? Your kids are still going to have those feelings. So that's kind of step number one is to make sure that we're acknowledging those and validating those and saying, you know what? I get sad sometimes too. And yeah, that's a stressful situation. You know, I'd be worried as well. So kind of what I want to make, you know, what I want to kind of impart to you in, in a short amount of time is, um, is what's been established as what I think is the gold standard of, of therapeutic intervention for, you know, anxiety and a variety of uncomfortable feelings. And so what, what we call that in the therapy world is cognitive behavioral therapy. It's the gold standard therapy for anger, for frustration, sadness, anxiety, and stress. In a nutshell, it's a form of therapy that emphasizes the important role of thinking and about highlighting this part of our world and, and helping kids to kind of, you know, manage those feelings and, and, yeah, and, other, and manage their behavior because your feelings lead to behavior. So this is just kind of a picture version of that. The beauty of it is that our feelings kind of come automatically sometimes, but this thinking part of our world is, is, is our way of kind of managing that. So we, it's what I like to tell kids that I worked with over the years is that you have all the tools you need. I just need to wake them up a little bit. I just need to help you practice using those, those thinking skills to help you manage your feelings. So here's your neuroscience um, quick lesson for the day. Um, and I teach this to kids because I want kids get really, really overwhelmed by their feelings. They're scary, right? I mean, I don't know if you've ever even come close to having a panic attack, but it is like feeling like you're dying. And, you know, so those feelings are really overwhelming. And what I try and teach kids, what I try and share with them um, is this little lesson, you know, to kind of help them understand that it's not not their fault, you know, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that they have this heightened thing happening in their brain that happens in every single brain and that has to happen in the brain. So I teach them about this little thing. It's the blue thing in your slide and the blue thing in the, in the picture, it's called the amygdala. 
it's kind of the emotion center of the brain. It's where the alarm system is, you know? So if you ever kind of seen alarms on the walls of school, do they even have those anymore? Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the alarm system. It's, it is the oldest, oldest part of the brain. It is actually a part of the brain that we share with animals. Animals have an amygdala. If you walk up to a squirrel, what does a squirrel do? He runs away. If you walk up to a tiger, what does the tiger do? He will likely eat you. So, um, you know, the, your alarm system kind of puts you into that fight or flight response. It's either going to get your body ready to run or it's going to get your body ready to fight. It is very primitive. It is very automatic. It is, um, it, it is, it's not something that we have control over. It's in the part of the brain that just does its own thing. And thank goodness, because when there is a fire, when there is a tiger, <laughs> when, when there is a, you know, something looming at you, we need that alarm system to get us ready. So what that alarm system does is that it gets our heart pumping. It gets the blood moving to different parts of our body to get the muscles ready to either fight like the tiger or to run like the squirrel. I run like the squirrel. Um, so yeah, there's that amygdala. Important, right? Now, it's become less important over time because we don't live like cavemen anymore. We actually, I know this is going to sound kind of weird, live in a much safer society than they did. <laughs> they, they actually kind of had a lot more to worry about than, than we do now, um, to be quite honest. Um, but the amygdala is still there. It hasn't really changed much because it still has a pretty valuable job. Now, for some kids, for some adults, that amygdala is a little glitchy. Kids know what glitch means, you know, because it's what happens when their, you know, video games get stuck. And so they get that. They understand that things glitch and how frustrating that is. And, you know, I explain, like my amygdala, your amygdala gets a little glitchy. And sometimes the alarm goes off for no reason. Have you ever had the alarm go off in school and there was really no fire? Yep. You know, so they get that analogy. They understand this concept of having this emotional alarm system in their brain. So they have this glitchy amygdala. Well, in steps the other part of the brain that kind of sets us apart from squirrels and tigers. Squirrels and tigers don't have this part of the brain, what we call the prefrontal cortex. It's in the picture in the slide. It's the orange part at the front of the brain. It is what allows us to problem solve. It is what allows us to think. It gives us judgment. Um, you know, decision-making skills. It's really what has set us apart as humans, right? Um, and, and, and makes us a little bit different, has, you know, been responsible for all the inventions and all the things we've done as humans, good or bad. So it's, it's a, you know, obviously we can see where that would be an asset, like a good part of, you know, of, of the brain. But in this case, with this glitchy amygdala, it tends to get us into a little trouble. So the amygdala glitches, it's going off, the alarm's sounding, and your body is feeling a certain way because the amygdala is doing its job. It's getting the heart racing, it's getting the blood pumping, it's getting your muscles ready to do something. What does that feel like? What do kids usually say that feels like? What does that feel like to you? Stomach ache, hot, sweaty, you know, so the uncomfortable feelings and symptoms in the body. Um, important, but uncomfortable. So in steps the prefrontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, the smart thinking, what's going on part of our brain. It always wants to know what's, what's going on in the body. So it reads these symptoms, right? It reads this heart rate, it reads this blood pumping, it's, it's trying to diagnose the issue. And it kind of never settles until there's an answer. It doesn't take no for an answer. It doesn't take no problem here for an answer. It always has to have a reason why the body is doing what it's doing. So it settles on something. If the feeling is happening at school, school must not be safe. School has to be something I avoid. Boom, you got a kid with school phobia. I don't want to go there anymore. It makes me feel uncomfortable. And it blames, this part of the brain blames the school for why it's feeling that way. Fill in the blank, you know, I mean, so all these, you know, all, you know, all, all of our smart children um, in, their, in their prefrontal cortexes are blaming things for why their body's feeling the way they are. Meanwhile, it could just be a glitch in the system. It's a misinterpretation of what's going on. It's a bad diagnosis. Does that make sense? No. 
And it tends to make sense to kids. And it's the reason why, um, do you ever have a situation with your kids that they're, they're feeling a certain way, they say they're scared, they say they're sad, they say they're angry, but they can't tell you why? It's because there maybe isn't a reason why. And I caution parents in pushing your kids to give you a why. Because in some cases, it could just be this glitchy amygdala that's sounding and going off and creating all these body senses, and it doesn't have a real reason why. And if we keep pushing them as parents to give them a reason why, they'll come up with one. It may not be the right one, but they'll come up with one. So I, 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 I ask you to exercise caution in pushing your kids to come up with a why. You know, in that moment, you can validate that feeling. You know, you're, you're, your heart's racing, you're feeling sweaty and a little nauseous, your body's kind of making you feel really uncomfortable and, and you're not sure why. Yeah, that happens. It must be that amygdala glitching again. And I will say teaching them about the amygdala kind of has this secondary bonus of like being kind of funny because the amygdala, I mean, that's kind of a funny word, right? And if kids can, if you can get your kids to laugh, it's kind of hard to stay anxious. So just as an aside, it can be a little humorous um, way to distract them away from how they're feeling. But, um, but don't always like think that you're going to get a why because there may not be a why. They just could, you know, settle on a reason why and you just push them there. So we have to be careful and we, you know, so I think teaching your kids about the amygdala, about the glitch, about this part of your brain's tendency to want to find a reason, teaching them that helps them and keeps them from making those thinking mistakes that lead to a full-blown anxiety disorder. So if we allow that kid to make that connection between what their body's feeling and what their brain is thinking, school's not safe. Well, then we're going to perpetuate that, that, that story. That's the story that's going to stick in that kid's head. That's the narrative. That's the thought. And we call those thoughts irrational thoughts because nine times out of 10, there isn't a lot of evidence for that thought. Okay. All right. School's not always comfortable. School's boring sometimes, but not safe, you know, something to avoid. You know, if we foster that connection, you know, it's only going to get more and more entrenched. You know, so that's where we have to help them kind of break that connection and, and teach them how to identify, hey, buddy, is that a thought that's got some evidence or is that a thought we need to, to kind of get rid of? Is that, a, was that, was that your, is that your brain's like, you know, misinterpreting your glitch? And, and you have to like change the language based on how old your kid is, obviously. Um, but teaching them about the amygdala and the thought connection can kind of help you, you know, help your kid identify what stories is he telling himself that's creating more of a problem here? Is school really safe? So by teaching them this amygdala frontal cortex connection, you can teach them how to, you know, to examine their thinking and check in with their thinking to see if their thinking is actually based in reality, is actually evidence-based. All right, so you think that school's not safe. Let's take a look at that for a second. Let's, let's think of all the ways that school feels good. You know, have them make a list of all the reasons why school's not unsafe or that it's, it, it is safe, that it's fine, that it's fun, that it's a place of learning. Um, you know, you wanna try and help them, you know, develop that evidence or look at that evidence that's going to help them break that connection between the glitch in the amygdala and the thought in, in, in the prefrontal cortex. So we decide on whether or not that thought is valid or not by looking at evidence. And the, really the only way that we're going to help them to look at evidence or data in their life is by making sure that we continue to give them um, Exposure. I just want to jump down. Where is that? Exposure. What do you think is the first thing a parent is going to do if their child comes home and says, I'm scared. I don't want to go to school. What do a lot of parents do? They don't make them go to school. So that is probably the worst thing that you can possibly do because exposure is such an important part of this whole cycle. You know, you got the glitch, you got the irrational thought, and then you completely take your child out of the environment and any opportunity they have to prove that thought wrong. You know, so you have to, you know, make sure that 
you know, you don't completely take them out of the situation that's making them feel uncomfortable or, or anxious. Exposure is the key. So each time they go to school, even if it's for a half an hour, they're building that evidence. They're putting money back in that bank. They're building that confidence back up again. But you, you know, cannot take them out of that situation. You can't be that snowplow parent creating that path. You have to make sure that you are giving your children experience to help make sure that this narrative, this story is accurate, that they stop listening to that glitch and start using the evidence in their world to make sure um, that, they're, um, that they're thinking more accurately and not, not using this irrational thinking. Because like any bank, if you don't give them the experience that they need to, to, you know, to think more rationally, they're not going to have any of that evidence to help them. And they're just going to constantly buy into that glitch. They're going to constantly, you know, think that that glitchy amygdala is telling them something true, but it's not, it's just glitching. So different ways of, of, of kind of looking at it is, is, is pointing out data to the contrary. So you might have, you might hear your kids say, well, you know, this, this is the fact. And you might just say, all right, well, let's take a look at that. You think this. But last week we were in school and we had a really good time. So you want to make sure that, you know, you're always kind of pointing out, not saying you shouldn't feel that way. You know, don't feel sad. Don't feel scared. But, hmm, you know, you're feeling this way and you're thinking this. Let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at our experience. Let's take a look at what we know to help us here. You know, so you're helping them kind of build a more logic base. A lot of the kids I've worked with, you know, they roll their eyes because every time we helped give them a little exposure to something like building back their time in school or building back their time in something that was scary to them before, um, I, you know, I ask them I'm like, all right, so what do you know now? And they roll their eyes because that's like the one question I ask a million times. You know, what do you know now? What did you learn? And they'll say, oh, I just learned that school is really safe and it can be fun. And, and, and um, but making sure that we give them those experiences is really important. I think that's like one of the, the toughest things, um, you know, to do as a parent. So here's something like this what I was talking about, like using the appropriate language. Um, you know, the, the older kids, you know, are obviously a little more sophisticated and you can, you can teach them about the thinking errors that they're making. You know, as, as adults, sometimes we work on, you know, work if they're called cognitive distortions, different types of examples are catastrophic thinking, mind reading and fortune telling. When the kids are younger, you, you need to kind of shape that language a little bit. Um, you know, talking about, you know, the worry bully, that's one that really sits well with kids that are like seven to 11. Um, when the glitch happens and that mistaken thought pops in, I teach kids that it's like having a little bully in their head who's telling them what to do and telling them all these mean, un, you know, untruthful things. Uh, and they like that because it gives them some kind of a, like a, a, a villain to fight, you know, and it kind of gives it a persona. Um, unfortunately, kids under seven are a little trickier to teach these thinking strategies, to teach them about their thinking mistakes that they're making. At six, seven years old, kids don't really understand that they have thoughts yet. So it's hard to teach them to harness their thinking world and to assess their thoughts. You know, older kids, you can teach them, all right, this is what you're thinking. What's the evidence for it? What's the evidence against it? More evidence against it? All right, let's throw it away. But younger kids who don't even understand that they're thinking yet, you can't really do that. You can't really teach them how to use their thinking. So for the younger children, I always work with parents on the exposure part. They're, ex they're experiencing anxiety or some uncomfortable feeling in a certain situation. All right, let's build their exposure to it little by little so they naturally develop that evidence, that, that confidence. They naturally start to put confidence, you know, money into that confidence bank. Um, they might not be able to kind of make sense of it from a thinking perspective yet. They may not be able to create the story for it yet. Um, but by gradually exposing them to situations that are just stressful or uncomfortable, you start to teach them to make that connection themselves. Oh, I'm here and it's okay. And when you get home, you can reiterate that. We went to school and it felt good. Um, and that'll build those rational thoughts for them and build that confidence. Um, you know, anxiety is, a, is, is, is irrational thinking. Confidence is all rational thinking. It's understanding realistically 
what you can do and what your world can do for you. I don't necessarily want to talk the whole time. I want to make sure I leave some time for, for questions. Um, so I, I know I can stop now and, and answer any questions you have about any parts of that. I'm also um, always available via email for, for questions that folks would rather ask in a more private fashion. I'm, I'm fine with that too. We talked a little bit about some proactive things that you can do and I can answer questions about and then, you know, kind of learning a little bit more about how to help your kids harness their thinking world. If they're showing like visible signs of dist distress and communicating in some way that, that, you know, a certain, you know, situation, a place, um, transition is, is creating stress for them. Well, then, you know, we want to create a plan that can help expose them. Um, so for kids with limited language and speech, you might want to use pictures and picture social stories to help them, you know, prepare for a doctor's appointment or a new school or, you know, joining, you know, a soccer team or whatever the case may be, um, you know, actual putting one foot in front of the other um, exposure to that situation is really important and, and developing some way of communicating, you know, um, you know, how they're feeling that they're doing well, um, whether it's with pictures or sign or, or, or what have you. Um, but, you know, for kids like that, it's really important that, you know, we, you know, kind of, kind of take them out of the, the bubble a little bit, but little by little, piece by piece, step by step, you know, give them that exposure to that situation, you know, um, by, you know and, 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 um, giving them that opportunity to build confidence um, because doing builds confidence um, and avoiding does not. Um, so um, creating that, that plan that in includes um, exposure, you know, even if they can't you know, express themselves verbally or, or discuss what's going on in their head verbally in a way that we can understand. I hope that answers that question. Yeah. Uh, come up with the right line of exposure versus your kid then not feeling safe with you putting them in a situation that they don't feel comfortable in. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so my favorite psychology answer is, is it depends. And for those of you who did not hear the question, it's like, how do you find that line between exposure and tra traumatizing your child, right? Um, your kid will let you know, um, and, you know, and in, when you can, you may be working with somebody like me to kind of help you develop a plan like that. But you know, it's really about taking the smallest step you can at, to, to build success early. Um, I had a kid with um, school phobia that was so afraid of going to school that literally the first step in our exposure plan was just getting the child up in the morning and getting dressed. Um, and then that was the success for the day because that was the smallest step that we, we could come up with that could help that child feel successful. Um, so, you know, it's about, it's like a ladder of exposure is, is really what they call it. And so the next step in this particular child's plan was just to get into the car, put the radio on um, and, and so forth and so on. And so, you know, it took, it took, you know, four to six weeks to even get the kid into the front door. Um, but that's what was going to help this particular child put money in that confidence bank, um, because you really want to pick a step, a size step that's going to help them feel successful. You don't want to take too much. So it's, you know, there's no, there's no, you know, there's no Google to help you figure that out. Uh, it's really just a trial, you know, you know, a, a trial basis. But if you take a step and it's clearly too distressful, back off the next day and try something a little bit smaller. Um, I had a child with a needle phobia and, you know, at, at first we just um, read about in, you know, injections. She needed certain injections for a medical condition that she had. We just read stories about it. Then we watched videos about it. We watched, you know, videos of adults getting the injection, then of children getting the injection. And then we had a, like a fake syringe and we pretended to give her teddy bear an injection. And we built that exposure really, really small and really, really slow because we wanted with each step for her to build confidence, not get more and more scared. So you try and do trial and error. Um, but that exposure piece is really important because at the end of a successful step, guess what the thought up here is? That wasn't so bad. I did it. I was nervous, but I did it. And now, and it was okay. Um, rather than, 
you know, listening to that glitch and interpreting it as that was the worst thing ever, you know, so we want to create an experience that's going to help them, you know, challenge that irrational thinking and, and create more, you know, evidence-based thinking and taking steps small enough to help them build that confidence. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, we have another question here. Building from that, what do you do about setbacks mm -hmm. in that safe experience? Um, mm -hmm. If a child is only managing to go to school for mm -hmm. half an hour, two days a week, and during that half an hour that they're at school, and it, you as the parent have now left them there and an adult in the building yells at the child. Mm -hmm. Now the child is not feeling successful and has a new piece of anxiety. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? Well, so yeah, because setbacks are going to happen. I think that's something important to talk with kids about ahead of time. You know, so as you're building those, the, you know, creating those steps and building currency in that confidence bank, document it whether it's keeping a journal, a video journal, a blog, whatever the kid wants to do, document those successful steps. That way you have something to fall back on if you do need to kind of take a few steps back. When you are building a plan for a kid with that level of anxiety, it's really important to communicate that to the school. You know, and, and I've had you know, varying levels of cooperation from schools over the years. You know, I've had the this, this spectrum of, you know, some schools like Chenango Valley who will, who will bend over backwards to get a kid back in school, um, you know, and, 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 you know, create half day programming and, and communicate the plan to all of the child's teachers and adults. And, um, you know, allow for home-based tutoring while a child builds, you know, their time back into school, um, you know, and, and some schools are, are not as cooperative as others, but I think just communicating it to everybody will help that plan be more successful because you don't, you know, want that kid to be exposed to taking a step back. Okay, so in that realm, mm -hmm. um, when the child is experiencing that level of difficulty and mm -hmm. that level and, and repeated setbacks mm -hmm. and the school's response is to threaten you with CPS or pins, mm -hmm. like how as a parent do you respond to being threatened rather than helped? Well, I, I you know, I'm, I'm sorry that there's, there's that level of kind of breakdown and, and, lack of collaboration because you know I, I you know nine times out of ten my experience has been schools are very willing to collaborate and you know and that's perhaps where an organization like the special education task force can can be an, an asset and a resource to families is to help build that collaboration that bridge because um you know I think it, it takes the team to to to, to help a child get over that level of anxiety and, and, and finding resources in your community to help you bridge that collaboration could, you know, could be helpful. I, and that's not to say that CPS isn't, isn't a valuable resource, um, you know, in building that collaboration too, but finding, you know, agencies that are, you know, feel comfortable to you to help build that bridge because that, that communication is invaluable and, and absolutely necessary to help the child get, get back on track, whether it's school phobia or, any other, you know, um, issue that their, their anxiety or depression are getting in the way of, um, but finding someone to help you mediate that, that, that relationship is probably really important. Cause you're right. That repeated setbacks are frustrating and, and certainly, um, make it in the long run more difficult for kids to, to build that confidence and, and feel successful in those exposures. Right. Yeah. It's a good question. We haven't had a successful exposure yet. Maybe the steps aren't small enough. No. I mean, at that point, you know, I probably need to talk separately, but yeah, but we haven't had a successful exposure and mm -hmm. I'm not sure what to do with it. Yeah, no, that is frustrating. And I'm definitely more than happy to, to troubleshoot that more with you one-on-one -on -one if you'd like. Yes, ma'am. Um, just kind of, so we're talking about anxiety with irras irrational anxiety, basically. Mm -hmm. What about when that anxiety comes from, for example, her example, mm -hmm. there's an episode where mm -hmm. someone was yelled at or they were at school and they had a bully or they had a mm -hmm. reason and they had anxiety for a legitimate reason. Mm -hmm. What do you still work the same type of steps? Because you're not explaining to them that their anxiety is rational at that point and that there's a disconnect. They had a true 
Yeah, no, I try and teach kids the difference between fear and anxiety. And obviously, you know, scary things happen. And, um, you know, you know, and I think what I'm talking about is like the lingering effects of something like that and, and how you would help a child kind of recover from from that. But if there's a legitimate, you know, event that creates that, you know, that fear response, that has to be addressed, too. I mean, that that's like a, you know obviously a, a separate thing that needs to be addressed and, and, and working collaboratively with your, with your, with your child's school. Um, you know, but what could happen as, you know, subsequent to that is that an event could trigger the glitch, right. And, and can kind of create ongoing anxiety that can keep that child from reintegrating into whatever activity, you know, that, that they've, you know, avoided because of uncomfortable feelings. Um, and, and that's where that exposure plan, you know, can be helpful, but, if there are day-to-day -day events happening that are triggering legitimate, <laughs> you know, stress response, well, then that needs to get addressed too. And that's, but that's a, that's a different, you know, that that's a different, you know, issue altogether. It's the, you know, it's the, it's the repercussions of that, you know, that, that kind of, this can help with and, and building exposure back, but you want to make sure you're building exposure <laughs> in, in a safe environment. So if some, if there needs to be some discussion about, you know, your child's educational programming and what that day leads to look like, then, then that's an important discussion too. And again, I imagine that the special ed task force can be a good resource in, in, in finding ways to, to make that happen. Okay. So th this book, What to Do When You Worry Too Much, I hope you guys can see it is part of a, a, a series written by, um, you know, a, an author called, named Don Huebner. Um, I guess if I just hit images, maybe you'll see a better picture. I don't want to necessarily give Amazon all the credit, but that's kind of what it looks like. Um, and she's written a series of workbooks. This is good for kids like eight to 12. Um, there is what to do when you're wor worried too much, what to do when your temper flares, um, um, what to do when you grumble too, too much, which is more kind of that pessimism and irritability. Um, it's just a really good series of books that I've, I've used over the years. It's, an, it's a workbook. You do that interactively with your child. Um, you know, there's, there's some, some books for older kids too. And if you're interested in an age specific um, kind of book list, please feel free to use my email and I'll just cut and paste, you know, my bibliography. Um, I'll send you some, some good, um, you know, I'll send you some good titles based on your kid's age, but this is a really good one. Really, really good one. Hello, everybody. Um, what a great presentation tonight. I want to give some thanks really quick before we get off of here. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Pelletieri for coming out and giving this presentation to both the Shenango Valley community and um, the Southern Chair Special Education Task Force region. Um, I also want to thank um, Tara Whitaker and Shenango Valley for co-hosting this event with us. This has been a wonderful experience being able to do all of this together. Um, I also want to thank Nancy um, for her introductions and also the video that she played. Nancy, was there anything else you'd like to share? Um, just if anyone has any interest in joining the task force, we are always looking for new membership. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, I will be sending you an evaluation form link. We put it in the chat, but we'll also send it to you via email tomorrow. And we'll get you the PowerPoint as well. Um, and in a couple of weeks, we'll certainly get you the um, recording of this event. So we really appreciate all of your support. 